All right, well, this time around, I wanted to take a little time and talk about some of the other options and menus and things that you can do within the game. All I've really done is go to the world map, do a couple custom flights, and fail miserably at doing ILS recently. <laughs> so I wanted to talk about some of the other stuff. So let's look at challenges. Takes a bit to load. Now, I like the idea of these challenges. They're supposed to change. I honestly don't think this one has changed. It says every two weeks they change. Maybe just the icon and the picture hasn't changed. Honestly, this is really the first time I've clicked in here. I have not attempted one of these. But I don't recall the image changing. Now, I like the idea of these weekly challenges, but I hope that they take it a little differently, like make you fly a certain path or come up a, up the valley or something, maybe do something a little more unique than just basic land here, land there, do this, do that. Just because everybody has a different flight system, everybody is not on equal footing, so the folks with full HOTAS and proper rudder controls are going to be able to do really well at these, whereas the rest of us are just going to be kind of piddling along. So it'd be nice to have a different type of challenge, maybe do one that's more like a Red Bull racing through barriers or up the valley and then come around and make a crazy landing or something. Like maybe approach this airport from the wrong direction and see if you can actually land in time. Something unique and fun, but I like the idea of these challenges. I hope to see more of what they accomplish in these. Activities are also kind of cool. Give you again more landing challenges. Again, there's the same airport and the same landing uh, from the other weekly challenge, which I think is a little bit redundant. And then I like the bush trips option where you can kind of fly around backcountry, do different types of flying. I've done the uh, cub flight once. I was in some part of Alaska where you can see some bears. And it was a lot of fun to fly the little cub up over the mountains and uh, come down into the valley, find the bears, circle around, and then make a landing. It was a lot of fun. Um, difficult, but it was pretty fun. Windy day when we did it. I hope to see some more other options in here for activities because there are just a lot of things you could do, like fly through bad weather or do something. There's just fun things that they can make up and just create fun things or even let the community kind of create some fun challenges, fly around mountains, pretend you have tourists, I don't know, something fun like that. Flight training. This is one that I really wish was a little more flushed out or at least that they do pretty quickly in the future because I like the idea here. Now I haven't gone through all of this, but I like the idea that it starts you off in a basic plane, teaches you the basic controls, cameras, functionality of the game, and then they start stepping it up, giving you the instrument options, how to do takeoff and level flight, landing, traffic patterns for flying downwind, base, um, all that good stuff, doing a solo flight, navigation, using um, the world to fly around as well as hopefully um, I don't think they'll do a lot in here other than the um, VOR style with radio frequencies, which will be good to know, and uh, then maybe some visual flight rules. But what I'd like to see with this is not only that they start you out in this basic one, but once you complete the basic tutorial, hopefully they don't put it behind a you have to beat these first, but allow you to step up because there's a lot of different options in aircraft so they could do bush flying or light aircraft flying as your first introduction to the different systems and the flight modes and then from there you can learn how to fly executive jets like the citation and the longitude and then from there you can learn um, short haul flights such as the king air or the tbm and then from there step it up into airliners and as, as you progress through each option you learn more about more in-depth computer systems and navigation and flight patterns and flying into larger airports and navigating airspace and communicating with ATC on a much more in-depth basis because I think that would be a lot more interesting than just these basic tutorials because we're left with 747s and Airbuses that most of the casual players aren't really going to know how to fly properly and it may be something that they want to do but they may not have the time to go through and watch a bunch of videos and go back and forth. Whereas if you progress them through different aspects of the computer system like this, it'd be a lot of fun for somebody to go learn a little bit without wasting a whole chunk of their limited flight time learning. So I'd like to see a little more come out of the flight training area, but I, I like that it's there. It's a great option. Next is the marketplace. And honestly, this is probably one of my largest disappointments other than the fact that somebody didn't realize rudder controls weren't functioning on controllers. Now the marketplace here, this is kind of the quote unquote official marketplace of the game. There's not really another one anywhere else. So if you come in here, they've got a bunch of categories. You can wish list things. It, it's got some neat ideas with airplanes, airports, texture packs. I like how people can rate them. What really kind of gets me is 
and, and my biggest complaint here is it's really hard to understand the value for what you're getting. So if I click here to go into Copenhagen, I understand that I'm getting a much more in-depth airport, better textures, they give me all the feature information, that they're giving me animated jetways, detailed models of the bridges. The airport looks beautiful. Rainy weather. Let's go through some of the pictures. That looks fantastic. Beautiful. But in all honesty, how does this compare to the original? I can't see a side by side to look at it and go, you know what? Yeah, this is a huge step up. I love this. This is worth $17 to me. Now, for me in America, buying Copenhagen where mm, I probably won't do that much flying is not going to be that big of a value. But if you live in the area like this was your home airport, heck yeah, 17 18 bucks for that would be fantastic. Like if somebody did this for DFW, I'm sure somebody will at some point, I, yeah, I'd buy it because that's <laughs> my main large airport. I would love to fly more out of a much more detailed airport. But there again, there's no real comparison of what the original airport delivered to help you see what you're getting here. There's no like a demo for an hour or something or even mini videos in here just to give you a quick flyby tour of the airport and show some of what it does. You'd have to go to YouTube and out of the game in order to find it. So again, I think this is a massive missed opportunity. And if for some reason it doesn't work or it's utter garbage, they don't really discuss anything about a return policy, which is a little rough in my opinion. So, and not only that, you have to buy with flights and credits which is kind of dumb but whatever so that's that's a huge missed opportunity now a couple of these actually do give you some pretty good visual reference of what's going on let me see if i can find it like o'hare is not bad it's pretty expensive all things considered um the one i wanted to highlight was denver's see now here's where some things come in now why is denver so much cheaper it's $15 against O'Hare at $20. Now, yeah, Denver's not quite as insane as O'Hare, but it still has a fair amount of details that need to be put in. You've got the Weston Airport right here, the mustache on front. You've got the terminal that's very unique and different. You've got the different concourses, multiple towers. There's a lot of detail in the airport that's different. It doesn't mean it's, it's harder or it's easier to build and design than O'Hare, but again, what is the difference in value for money that makes me want to spend more for O'Hare? And you can see there's 198, almost 200 four-star ratings of this one in O'Hare. Let's go back. Only has 34 for $5 more. Now, again, it looks beautiful, and I'm sure it's very detailed and a lot of work within to it. And I'm not saying it's not worth $20, but it's hard to gauge the value that you're getting from some of these. The reason I'm highlighting DIA is they showed some more variety about the ground effect with weather and things like that. So let's see here. I was talking about showing some comparison shots, and it's not a complete comparison shot, but again, they're giving you some really good detailed imagery of things that you can see in the airport. And coming up is one of my favorite reasons for this. You can see you've got some like wet here, dusting of snow, full snow, and dry giving you a great layout of how the airport's going to look under different weather conditions and I think that's just fantastic. It looks great. Still doesn't give you a great comparison of what the default airport looks like against this, but it still is a good step up. And look at that at night. Again, they're giving you a lot of great reasons to buy this airport because they're showing you just how awesome it looks. That's what needs to happen here because that's just fantastic looking and I think this is well worth $15. I'm just not going to buy it yet because I'm actually going to go fly around these airports to see what the difference is. Now, again, O'Hare looks fantastic. Lots of good work. They give you a couple different types of shots. They even have some internal um, parts of the terminals that you can see into. I think that's fantastic, but that's really the only imagery they give you. And O'Hare has so much to it that it's again difficult to try and fully judge every aspect of what you're getting from a couple of these shots and if you look at this the terminal here looks kind of dark whereas DIA's had a lot more lighting effect going on so again just a little difficult to flat say yep every aspect of this is worth it so that's that's my main call out the other reason why I want to kind of call this out as a problem I don't know why I favorited that 
um, is Microsoft is trying to do everything in-house like so many people with digital distribution and it's just a complete waste of their time. They're Microsoft. They make some decent games. They've had a decent gaming division, but when they try to implement things like this, it just falls flat on its face. It's just terribly implemented. If we go back to like games for Windows Live, what a garbage application that caused so many problems that they had to just do away with it. Why can't they just simply stick with the digital distribution platform that's been running for a very long time? They can still require us to sync up with them for certain aspects of it, but why not allow like the Steam Marketplace? You allow me to buy the game from Steam. Why can't you allow the Steam Marketplace to integrate with the game properly? Because think of that. All this content, all the people who want to put out free content, you just click a simple like button like you favorite it on the Steam platform, it automatically downloads it to your computer, adds it to your profile, and installs it. Done. You don't have to do anything else. You just simply load the game and it's ready to go. If you reinstall the game, your profile remembers all the content you have favorited and it will download it again. If something breaks or stops working, you can go unfavorite it and it pulls it off your computer. I think that part could be a little easier to find, but again, it's very simple to just scroll through and click a bunch of content. And if somebody wants to add some basic texture packs or even charge you for some DLC packs in there, it's a lot easier because you've got videos that are typically implemented with a lot of um, the content that gets created along with all the screenshots and user reviews. And it's all tied into the game itself as a community hub, making it a lot easier to deal with than this kind of frankly difficult to scroll through store. I mean, it's not very easy to come down here and look at all this stuff and figure out what's really got good value, what doesn't, when it's kind of a, a limp implementation of this with this big page that's very consoleized. Now I get it, if this was the way you were gonna do it on the Xbox, okay, then that's what you get for the Xbox. But we're not on the Xbox, we're on computers, and that's really a disappointing implementation. Now. There are some third party things out there, and this is another big failure, which is why I believe Steam would have been a better way to implement this, because there's a lot of content starting to come out that is somewhat free from third party developers, but it's a pain in the bleep to get it installed, because depending on how you purchase the game, it installs differently on your computer, so you have to find different local or roaming folders within your specific user um, folder on your computer. Or it's through Steam. It's kind of a crapshoot as where the folder content's going to be. That's really a pain, especially for the casual player. I've dealt with those folders in the, in the user folder a lot for many different games since going back to Windows 2000 and earlier. But a lot of people just want to load up and play. And now if they want to get new content or new liveries and, and all these other things for their game, they're suddenly having to spend all this time copying gigabytes worth of data into a folder they've probably never seen. Windows probably has hidden by default for them because it's not a folder people typically should be going in and messing with. And then if you reinstall the game or you want to update it, you have to copy everything back into that folder again in order to do that. On top of which... Someone like me, I try to keep my Windows and core applications isolated onto different hard drives to maximize performance. It's not as necessary with solid state drives, but the liveries pack was 2.2 gigabytes of data to download. Currently on my Windows 7 install um, that I'm still using primarily, I have 128 gig SSD and anytime Windows wants to run some updates, it downloads 15 gigs worth of junk to preload and then I have to go in and uninstall all that just because of the way Windows works. Now Windows 10 has a smaller footprint and when I rebuild the computer to do everything with Windows 10 properly I'm going to upgrade that to a 256 gig hard drive but now because of games like this I have to start thinking is 250 gigabytes going to be enough in order to store the entire content of whatever comes out. If I start getting larger airplanes or if somebody makes another batch of textures or maybe they increase some world textures, how many gigs is that gonna take on my operating system drive? That's garbage. It should be on my gaming drive, which is a much higher quality SSD made for heavy read writes because I'm dealing with games and temporary files, whereas Windows, it, you get a couple temporary files, you get some Windows updates and that's it. But that other drive was purpose 
set up to handle all of my games and installs. So my Steam directory is chock full of stuff and it's easy to find and navigate. But I think that's the, the largest loss and annoyance within that entire thing. So I already went ahead and downloaded the liveries pack. It's free. You can uh, get it online. And we can start at the TBM, and you can see all the different liveries that are available. This is a fairly large file, coming with quite a few different uh, airline looks, colors, all sorts of neat stuff on there. And it just really looks awesome to get these different paint jobs and things on the plane. Um, one thing that is kind of annoying though is the way that it can kind of glitch out and the game has problems pulling it because they're loading from the profile. And you can change aircraft and we can look at just how many of these liveries there are, especially if we go to like the 747 here. Go back, go to liveries. Let it load. This one's got quite a few and some classic ones. Looks like there may be some issues with it pulling the images for some of these, like Air China. Uh, shouldn't look like the standard Boeing livery. There it is, see it loads in, but that is the correct one. So this is some of the glitches that I'm talking about, because the I've been in here before and these have been the right images. So like if I try to go home, back in the profile, and you can see how laggy things get when it's trying to read all this information. There's Air China. I guess it doesn't want to load these today, but okay, that's the way it goes. But there's so many of these out there that you can have a lot of fun. They even got the Iron Maiden one in there, which is, I found funny. Big yellow mustard airplane. Check out the Iron Maiden plane. Of course, it's a shot of something that doesn't help me much. You can see some of the logo on the engines. Come on. Give me a shot that shows something neat. There you go. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, if I change airplanes, oops, change airplanes, we can go to the 787, go back, liveries, and you can see here the profile thing is now this mini little window. This only started happening when the game was trying to load all of these other liveries and if you notice it's still showing me the 747 now see 747 so it's glitched again so if I go home profile hangar now let's let the plane load if it's going to load there it is liveries oh I've only got the default one now okay let's go back profile you can see how annoying this is because this can also happen when you're trying to actually select the liveries. Let's try a new aircraft. Where's the A320? Let's go back. Liveries. So now it doesn't want to load anything at all, suddenly. Even though I just had them and they were working. Here we go. So now we got the a320 and there are a ridiculous amount of liveries as you can see here for the a320 more than anything out there but you can see how many issues this has because this is not official you can't just pull these things into the game properly so i'm really really disappointed with a lot of what microsoft did for these content things and that's part of what makes the flight simulator community so good is because they pump out a lot of good content but if you can't easily get it into the stinking game, there's no point. So I love these liveries. That's the only thing I've really bothered to do at the moment just because everything else and this alone is such a hassle. I may pick up an airport, but at the moment I already paid for DIA to be slightly fancier in the game itself. And the game itself was fairly expensive to get that extra content. So... I really want to go see what the difference is because I'm not dropping another $14 just for one airport a month after the entire game came out at $120 and seriously so anyway I just wanted to go on a little bit of a rant talk about some of the issues with this content and a big missed opportunity on Microsoft's part so thank you guys for watching we'll see you next time